I'm going to talk about two houses uh, today, um, house two and house three. They're part of a sequence of three houses, but we didn't excavate completely house one, which underlies this. I will mention it maybe a couple of times, but it's essentially these two houses, house two and house three. Uh, and they're part of a, a, a large settlement, which consists, of, uh, they're in a settlement mound, and they're part of a large settlement, which consists of at least five uh, mounds, which would all have comparable sequences of buildings, but they're probably not of the same uh, size and therefore status as these buildings. So this appears to be the main sort of status focus, surrounded by a series of, of smaller and different farm, farm mounds. And we're out here on the Outer Hebrides, uh, off the west coast of Northern Scotland. Um, we ha have a very good chronological handle on these houses because of a large uh, sequence of radiocarbon dates that we've uh, obtained from them and also because of the Bayesian modelling undertaken by Pete Marshall uh, for the houses. And house two, you can see, is constructed um, late in the 11th century um, or possibly just a little bit possible early in the 12th century. Um, and it was abandoned pretty quickly later. It doesn't seem to have been occupied for more than a single lifespan. It's got a relatively short-lived occupation. House 3, there's a gap, quite a substantial gap, and then House 3 is constructed after a phase really where this location is abandoned and there's lots of infilling and windblown sand accumulation. These scrappy structures are built. So it's quite a long period of intermittent uh, scrappy activity and then House 3 is built um, as early as possibly in the middle of the 13th, but probably later, and going on to be occupied right into the 14th century, and it probably is a much longer uh, lived uh, phase of activity. It's probably a good couple of generations could have occupied that house. So House 2, um, very simplified. Uh, I could go into this in some detail, but we did, we did discuss these in the last session last year, so I won't go into the architecture in too much detail. But there's a major difference between the two houses. House 2 is a classic bow walled Scandinavian longhouse, 20 metres long, 5.8 metres wide, perfectly normal kind of dimensions. Uh, subterranean, this is slightly unusual, so this plan's standard, but the construction method is a little bit more unusual. It's dug into the, the settlement mound, which goes back to the Pictish period, and, and the, the, the walls, are, the house is defined by very substantial stone walls which were made out of really large blocks of good building stone. Now that's almost certainly been robbed out of existing pre-Norse settlements on the Macher, because this, where this is located is on a sandy plain, there is no stone like this on this sandy plain, but there are lots and lots of other settlements which would have have uh, been, uh, been using these very good building stones. So I think there's an element of robbing which has possibly social, uh, social significance in terms of trying to create connections with other ancient dwellings. Uh, there's a tripartite division of the house into a long central area uh, which is defined by hard compact ash deposits. We're not able to identify specific half areas what seems to have happened is that they built hearths uh, quite uh, irregularly over this area and then spread out the ash across this central uh, routeway activity area down in the centre of the house. And then neither side of that, uh, there are two aisles, uh, two, uh, two areas where we have thin uh, floor levels which are really um, just charcoal and rich sand uh, layers. And then the entrance, uh, classically asymmetrical, close to the east end, so that you come in and then you turn to the left and you've got the whole of the house laid out in front of you to the left. House 3, quite a different uh, shape. It's uh, rectangular. Um, arguably, it's, uh, it indicates a major sort of significant cultural change in the nature of the architecture of this period. And we, we could, we, 
The evidence is not very good for these kind of uh, medieval houses in the rest of Argyllshire and, and mainland Scotland, but there's, it's arguable that we're looking here at the introduction of a Scottish type of dwelling, a much more rectangular, plain card shaped. Um, and the, the chronology, it would, would fit in with that because there's a major political change between the construction of both these houses. So house two is constructed when the islands are controlled by, nominally controlled by the Kingdom of Man, which show, uh, aligns itself with the Scandinavian kings. Whereas now, after 1266, we're part of the Kingdom of Scotland. And so this could represent a significant um, change in the people living on the settlement, or it could simply re uh, represent a, a culturation and a conscious change by the family that occupies this settlement. Structurally, again, it's, it's significantly different. We no longer have the subterranean house. We have uh, a stone, stone wall footing, so it's defined by a stone wall. Uh, but that seems to be just a footing for a timber frame. This isn't a reconstruction of that house, this is a reconstruction of another smaller house, but it shows the basic principle. We have a timber frame that sits on a stone wall and then it's clad in turf. So again, there's a significant change and the use of turf becomes very important in this period. And all the houses seem to have this timber and turf cladding. And again, timber is an important resource, which is why I was talking about it this morning, uh, because there's no timber on the island. There are simply no trees that are good enough uh, to, to be used in this kind of house. It all has to be imported uh, from mainland Scotland or, or possibly from Scandinavia, but a bit unlikely in this period. There are also two distinct floor layers, and you can see that they no longer have this aisle sort of uh, pattern. Instead, we have discrete halves arranged uh, down the centre of the house. And there are no post holes, so obviously uh, these guys had lots and lots of friends. <laughs> uh, we have pads, so flat stones, uh, which I think might have been uh, possibly pads for uh, the, a, a, an internal timber structure, which wasn't necessary for these smaller houses. But this is a very big house, it's uh, 5.6 metres wide, so I think it's likely that it would be some kind of internal uh, frame. So that's a brief run through the structural evidence, but I wanted more to concentrate on the fines and the, the relationship to the occupation of the house, as that seems to be more of the theme of this session. And there are very significant differences between uh, the, the two different houses and between the different floors in the houses. And it's probably best summed up by this uh, diagram here, which shows the kind of artifacts, the small finds, the nice stuff, uh, which we can divide into functional categories. There's waste, bone, and a waste, tools, personal ornaments, fittings, and miscellaneous items. And you can see that the blue uh, is the house two material, and that assemblage dominates. It's massively, substantially larger than anything from the other two houses. And when we look at the numbers from the pottery assemblage, we've got 24,000 uh, grams of uh, pottery from house two and 180 from the floor of house three, and this is the first floor, and 313 from the second floor. So numbers of shares, 3,341 and 60. You know, we're at a completely different level as we pass through this uh, from one to the other. So there's a major difference there, but it's less clear when one looks at the micro residues. Now, as part of the excavation strategy, we completely uh, we bagged and floated all of the floors, uh, which was quite a substantial undertaking and only really possible because we're in a very sandy uh, soils and we were able to push through 60 samples a day. And so it was quite an incredible feat of organization and left me with lots and lots of bags of stuff, um, which takes an enormous amount of time to sort and categorize. So we, we've sampled the residues, but we have done it on a fairly large scale, much larger than most people. And we have significant um, uh, 
quantities, quantification of the distribution of micro residues across the floor. So this is stuff between 2 millimetres and 10 millimetres. Uh, we haven't gone down below 2 millimetres because that way leads insanity. <laughs> And again, the pattern, the striking thing about the patterns is there's not much difference between the houses. Um, only eggshell comes out as very prominent in terms of house two, and animal bone again comes out prominent in terms of house two. The other patterns are more even, and, and it suggests that day to day, uh, what, uh, the interpretation I would put on this is that day to day activity is fairly similar in both phases, but the large number of finds, which possibly represent a uh, very conscious placement of material, is different. So there's a conscious social strategy being employed in House 2 that has gone by the time you get to House 3. And this comes across very clearly when one looks at the nice stuff, um, where this is good combs, you, all the, the dots show all the combs but the illustrated ones are the sort of fairly well preserved ones hurrying along, I mean basically it, it starts to pick out clusters and these combs are all um, probably in this house because they are being dismantled and reworked to create pendants it's a very scrappy assemblage and some of these are being cut down very old combs to make pendants Pins, we have an enormous collection of pins. The striking thing again are the clusters of pins, which one sees within the house, but also the fact that they're all largely complete. This is an assembly where 80% of the pins are complete. Now in any of the rest of the site, that would not be the case. It would 80% would be broken, fragmentary pins, and one or two complete ones. So very different assemblage. We have some interesting things. This is, uh, again, a cluster, of, a particular cluster of uh, tines. I just picked this out because I like them. I think these are related to drinking. I think they're finials for drinking horns, but nobody I've ever spoken to agrees with me about this. <laughs> so uh, you'll just have to take it. But I think it's to do with drinking, and I think there's a nice concentration, again, up here. And there's also a very nice Ringerica uh, cylinder, which, again, I think is some kind of drinking flask. Other interesting things, uh, we have a uh, fragment of green porphyry from Laconia in Greece, which is probably some kind of uh, Christian relic, a bit of gold, a bit of amber, possibly the arm of a cross from a, a, a Bible that's been ripped up, and a funny little lead uh, pendant. Again, a cluster, but a different cluster from where the drinking stuff <coughs> was. This also includes beads and uh, coins up there, so different clusters emerging. Even when we look at the tools, and again, this is just a small snapshot uh, showing knives and horns. Again, it's very clear clustering, and the clustering is patterning. So it's th three, uh, three clusters which have a pair of knives and a pair of horns. And the horns are imported from Scandinavia, so they're not insignificant objects. <laughs> Um, needles and whorls, and again, a pattern where the um, whorls are concentrated in that site and the needles are concentrated in that site. So, nice pattern. Completely different, we don't have clustering in terms of the ceramics. The ceramics occur as a very large spread over one end of the house. And I'll gloss over that, lots of dots. Um, so, we have a split in the house. When we look at the whole thing, you can see that it's a general pattern which fits in with the kind of general pattern we have for Viking longhouses. We have a kitchen area where all the pottery, large quantities of animal bone and other kind of material is, and lots of pits, these steep-sided pits which probably represent stations for timber and vessels. We then have a, a living area where we have all these clusters of very special finds, and then we have this area at this end of the house where nothing very much is found and where I think it's essentially a sleeping and storage area. Mm. Moving on quickly. House 3 is a complete contrast. You know, that was a sample of some of the finds distributions. This shows all of the distributions of every single find. So it's very small assemblage, 
very broken up. There's only two complete pins. Um, there's a couple of tools, but notice the biggest ones are, are tucked into the edge of the house. Most of the stuff is scattered down the centre around the heart. Again, in this case, the micro residues are more important. We can start to pick out different areas where fish bones are going in, large concentrations up by the entrance to the house, and a more dispersed spread of mammal bones. This is the sort of larger residues, not the micro residues. The micro residues, again, begin to pick out pottery distributions which might relate to cooking activities around the house and differentiating between different spaces within the interior of the house in terms of activity areas as opposed to deliberate deposition. The house, this, so this house is quite clearly split into a series of differentiated rooms which have hearths or not hearths. And they're, uh, they're not demarcated by any obvious boundaries, but they do show up when we look at the micro residues and they show up in particular in this relationship to the hearts. So again, I think there's a very significant uh, change here. There's a change in deposition from uh, the Norse period where we're getting conspicuous discard of large items which are... Oh, hold on, that's a conclusion I'm into. Just. And again, you can see this in even the smaller houses, these patterns, the sort of sort of shrinking down and of long hearths into smaller hearths. So concluding, um, there's a restriction, there's a movement from a very large open space, a communal space, where one imagines sort of fairly conspicuous consumption activities, which is associated in this house with a conspicuous discard of lots and lots of material culture <laughs> and lots and lots of material culture which has not functionally reached the end of its life. These pins are still all perfectly usable. Why are they being discarded there? And it raises the problem of whether we're, how does this relate to the de is this a death assemblage which is what we originally thought. Is this the abandonment of the house after somebody important has died and these have taboos about them. Well that doesn't seem to be the case in terms of microstratigraphy of the floor levels. We're getting complete objects very early on in the sequence of floor layers inside this house. It looks instead as though we've got people sitting in particular places within the house and leaving and discarding uh, material culture which is covered over. So there's a conspicuous kind of wastage occurring at this time which is markedly different from what occurs later on, where complete objects are being taken off, reused, and, and, and um, when eventually broken, are being discarded on the middens of the site. But also, I mean, this idea of a communal conspicuous display, a sort of feasting hall, an idea that this is a social space where you're inviting in lots of guests, doesn't really fit in with the individual clustering of the objects, which seem to indicate that people having particular spaces within the interior of the house. And I wonder if we're seeing, this is quite a late large bow-shaped hall. It's quite late in the sequence of the Norse occupation. And I wonder if we're already seeing what emerges in the later part of the medieval period, whereby people are dividing up the space and accounting for and formalising the division of space within the interior of the house. Anyway, I better shut up there. <laughs> Thank you.